Good morning, everyone. I'm Leela Sharon here, the Minister of Culture, Multiculturalism, and the Status of Women. I just want to thank everybody today for accepting this invitation to join me. Uh, the ministry really wants to know and understand the barriers that prevent women from fully participating in the workforce, and especially in STEM. And many of you who are here today and who may be online have broken, well, I would even suggest, have smashed through the, the glass ceilings. And so we really want to know for you, from you how we access these opportunities and especially for a, a lot of our young women that are coming up and that are really interested in these job opportunities, what it is that they can do and, and really get some advice from you who are trailblazers in this. And the province, you know, I think as a province we've made some tremendous progress in this, especially in advancing gender equity and for women, men and, and actually people of all genders. But as you know, and this is a common statement that we say all the time, but it's true. There's a lot more that we can do about crashing through those glass ceilings because everybody benefits. Women are empowered, capable, competent, and have every right to reach, reach their full potential. And so this is about family, this is about our economy and the future for our province and our kids. And the ministry is really interested in learning more about what may help women to pursue these rewarding careers in science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, this, as, as you know, and I don't need to tell people in this room, but we'll say it anyways, the sector is a key economic driver now and will continue to be in the province. And women working in these fields is actually really, really key to the success of the province and the future of our province and our collective success. So again, thank you for joining me. It's really great that we can do this during uh, Gender Equality Week. Happy Gender Equality Week. Um, and thank you for sharing your experiences. Let's celebrate our progress while reminding ourselves always that there's still a lot more that we can do. So I'm very eager, super eager to hear of your successes and your challenges. Um, I think too, what's gonna to be really important is that these future generations, many of you are, are um, you know, you're with a lot of young people all the time and you don't always get to tell your story. And this is so important for our future generations is them hearing from you directly, and especially those who want to enter into STEM. But most importantly, I really hope that by the end of this meeting that we can come together. Uh, we're really interested in strategies and understanding how we can do better. And um, so we're going to begin our discussions today, actually, with a wonderful lady, Mary Ann Gayeb from Northwest College. So Mary Ann, I am going to pass it over to you. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Minister Ahir, um, fellow Roundtable members, ministerial staff, uh, staff at the museum. Lindsay is going to be supporting us with the slides. Thank you very much for the invite. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, as Minister here mentioned, I'm the Vice President of Business Development at Northwest College. I am responsible for lifelong learning, industry partnerships, international recruitment and projects, as well as um, leading a number of strategic centers of excellence at the college, such as the Colburn Institute for Inclusive Leadership, the Landmark Group Center for Value Improvement, and the Edmonton Oilers Community Foundation Hospitality Institute. On top of that, I'm also the executive sponsor for equity, diversity, and inclusion strategy at the college, as well as the executive sponsor for our anti-racism task force, looking at issues of systemic racism and racial equity. Next, I would like to invite invite Nancy Biamonte from the Association of Professional Engineers and Geoscientists of Alberta to present. Hi, Nancy, please go ahead. Hi, Minister here, thank you. Um, really pleased to be here. Uh, so pleased uh, to be able to present some of our innovative programs and initiatives that are helping to set some of these foundations for success for women in STEM. So thanks very much. Thank you so much, Nancy. And finally, I will introduce our last presenter here, Carrie Voss, and then we're going to go back into the presentation. So Carrie Voss is from the Northern Alberta Institute of Technology. Please go ahead. Um, good morning. It is such an honor to be part of this Women in STEM event. Um, I manage several engineering technology programs at NEAT. Uh, my background is in environmental sciences and engineering design technology. Uh, it's through my work in these areas that I became an advocate for advancing women in STEM programs. Thank you so much, Carrie. So back over to you, uh, Marianne. We're so excited to hear from about your presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much. 
So uh, as previously mentioned, I think now is a really great opportunity for us to advance the conversation on women and girls being at the center of our socioeconomic recovery. It's imperative that we ensure that all the work that we have done and the success and the advances that we've made are not further compromised uh, due to the shifting economic conditions around us. It, it, it's even more imperative right now for us to amplify this work, recognize it as an area of great attention and put that due attention into it. I'm going to share a bit of a, an agenda with you of what I'd love to talk about. I probably have a handful of slides. I'd like to speak about what Norquest has done to address the global agenda call to action for the UN Sustainable Development Goals on gender equity and equality. I'd like to speak uh, to educational learning pathways that we've developed at Norquest College. I'd like to talk and address a number of systemic and cultural barriers that we have encountered and our clients and our community have encountered. From my perspective, I'm sure they will align with a number of the speakers today or add and uh, complement some of the ideas at the table. And last but not least, I'd love to share a call to action and an opportunity for what to do next and how we could do better. Norquest College um, has uh, one of its pillar strategies is social impact. Uh, and it's a big piece for us to advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and more specifically, number five. And we have put together an Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Council at the college that is responsible for ensuring our strategies aligned with our business goals and outcomes. And there is high level of accountability and leadership that ensures there is equity in our processes, our hiring, retention, development, uh, as well as ensuring there is representative seats uh, of all different uh, diverse dimensions from LGBTQ communities to women, uh, to people of different races, uh, to just overall diversity of thought. And creating an inclusive environment is not an easy one, but it's certainly one that's embedded within psychological safety and a willingness as an organization to say we are here and we are welcoming everybody to contribute to the success of the organization. We've done a number of things in order to ensure that we remove barriers to female students in our quest uh, population is about 65% female, 60 to 65, it varies from one year to another. And uh, about 10 years ago, we started something called the Thousand Women uh, Movement. And the Thousand Women Movement, the idea was about uh, we, get, we get a few women together, each would contribute $1,000, and we come up with a million bucks and figure out a way to support bursaries and childcare support for women on our campus. And sure thing, within a few years, we were able to open up a childcare center and offer a number of financial bursaries to support the female students that we had on campus. And it's kind of amazing. You walk into the building, you drop off your kid on the main floor, and you go to your labs on the fourth floor. It's a really powerful story around how in academia, we must embrace and understand how we can make our students more successful. Because if we can mirror that somehow and they get out into the workplace, they can ask for the things that help them become more successful and included and thought of and appreciated and supported within the workplace. Uh, we also did um, rebrand the Colburn Institute for Inclusive Leadership about a couple years ago. Um, before then, it was called the Center for Intercultural Education, had underneath it uh, 10 years of excellent applied research consulting and uh, training programs. But we recognized the tremendous amount of power that um, organizations can potentially uh, embrace if they were to offer more inclusive workplaces. So the Colburn Institute's mandate is to help support transform individuals so they can transform their organizations and build a place that increases innovation, performance, productivity, uh, positive outcomes, and overall competitiveness in the marketplace. Diversity and inclusion is not just the right thing to do for the workplace. It is something that's really important for the success of the organization. And those that have embraced a strategy around EDI within the workplace have um, really excelled at building their people up and supporting them, encouraging new ideas and diversity of thought. And through that, help them succeed um, and certainly be competitive. Some of the work that we've done in the Colburn Institute as well is to really focus on applied research and evidence-based uh, empirical research that would tell us what's really happening in the world, what's really happening in Canada, what's really happening regionally, and what's really happening locally. So we can have a better understanding of how much we've moved the needle on um, gender equity, on racial parity, 
And um, the, as much as I love to celebrate a lot of the successes we've had in this space, I think there's a lot more work to do and a lot more conversation and a lot more leadership that's needed in our community and our organizations to advance this agenda forward. Some of the things that we've also done is really built really cool regional and national partnerships. I'll just mention two of them for your uh, reference. So we work heavily with Winset at the national level where we try to figure out where are the leading practices, not best practices, leading practices that each sector, each industry needs to embrace to support an EDI um, perspective and lens within the workplace and within the fields of expertise. I think that's really critical because it understands sort of the nuances around the culture within each industry and within each uh, expertise of the STEM field. Uh, we also work heavily with WXN, and that's Women Executive Network. I am a diversity champion, and uh, every year I judge the top 100 most powerful women in Canada. And we have two categories in that one top 100 list. One is for STEM, and one is for trades. And I think that's really important to be able to distinguish those as fields of their own. And the idea behind setting role models and women that have uh, been trailblazers that have set the stage, broke the glass ceiling, uh, have done tremendous amount of work, is really important for us to sort of highlight. But also it's really important to highlight the machinist, technician, uh, the frontline women that have also uh, broken into fields that have been mostly uh, uh, male dominated. So a lot of the partnerships, I think, are really excellent because we can't do things on our own. And I think through partnerships, we learn, through partnerships, we advance, and through partnerships, we can amplify the voice of women and amplify um, the strategies that we want to advance within the sector. So I'll share a little bit about some of the programs. I won't go into a list of programs that we have at Northwest College, but I can tell you that we have a 50% representation of women in our environment uh, protection program and a number of our AI and machine learning programs that are currently in development will also feature strong programs to target women specifically and we have started our recruitment efforts early and we do it more often than we usually would um, the traditional recruitment efforts and I think that's really critical because um, I believe that women once they see each other in, in positions of uh, and in careers of STEM, they start to think that's not something that's too far away as a dream for me. And so what we've also done is made sure that we were walking the talk at the college. So we have an all-female executive team. The Dean of Business Environment Technology is also female. The Chair of Environment and Energy is female. The Chair of Technology is female. And that was intentional. And when they go out on recruitment fairs and speak to high schoolers, it's very important for girls to see women in those positions and say, I can aspire to that because that's a role model that I can follow. We tell amazing stories around that and it's been really powerful to see it. In addition to some of the recruitment efforts, we've made um, strides, but we still have a little bit of work to do around really ensuring that our curriculum is indigenized and internationalized and that our um, uh, textbooks that we use, which are heavily male dominant when you look in the STEM field, but if you open it up to open educational resources, you could use um, content and uh, references and books that are outside of the traditional models that you would use in STEM. So I think it's really important to start to use um, current um, materials that where women are featured within our uh, curricular activities. And in addition to that, we offer a number of uh, events and opportunities and networks uh, through the student union where we really, there is a strong commitment there to diversity and inclusion. Our skills of distinction, which are uh, the critical pieces that we integrate in all of our learning outcomes at the college are, um, there is a few of them, and one of them is actually inclusion. And the stories that we hear when our students come out and go to the workplace, a lot of people always say, you know, you could tell a Northwest grad. They have a sense and feel of them. And they have leadership skills around inclusion. And they work really hard within teams to share how we could potentially reach that and how we could build teams that are more inclusive and diverse. So it's really great to not only graduate graduates that have inclusive skills, but for them to go into the workplace and start to lead and become responsible citizens in that space. One of the challenges that we've seen in the education sphere is we might graduate a lot of women out of the STEM field, 
um, but we see that they don't pursue more professional status in that field. And I think that's something that's a bit of a hindrance and, and there has to be a conversion opportunity there that we need to consider uh, for this. And so um, I'd like for us to not just think of STEM as the field of women within uh, science, technology, and mathematics, but also the peripheral women in accounting and legal that sort of support that field and ensure its success. When you have that holistic strategy and take up approach of building those pathways and networks of women, I think that could help uh, really advance the professional status of women. I won't get too much into this, but I think, um, you know, in some of the programs that we have at the college, we've really focused on entrepreneurship because we believe that women lady bosses are a really great thing to champion and support. And uh, we find that there are some potential barriers within the industry itself that can really lead um, to women not being interested in being their own bosses because it's just too hard to kind of push forward on. So we do see potential opportunities there to address systemic barriers in um, the entrepreneurship space, uh, especially when it comes to the financing or being an accredited investor. Um, a number of the women who are really interested in sort of uh, pursuing their own business, especially in technology, uh, find that to be an accredited investor, you have to have tremendous amount of cash in the bank and tremendous amount of assets. And that's not common that you would see for women. And so I think we need to change some of the rules around that to be more inclusive of what it would mean to advance women in this area. We also see uh, some systemic barriers in education where there isn't a uh, greater alignment between K-12 and post-secondary. As you know from the Kim McKinnon report last summer, that we have a very low participation rate, 17% of people that come out of high school and get into post-secondary. And within that, you also see a reduced number of women getting into post-secondary as well, and especially in non-traditional fields like STEM. And so the challenge that we've seen is that if there isn't a promotion of STEM at the K-12 level, you won't see more embracing of STEM fields in the post-secondary sector. So I think we need to do a little bit of work around that. We also see there are a number of culture barriers within certain industries. Um, and there's a few of them that have done a really good job that we can learn from, like the financial sector. If you look at the big five banks, 33% of their top leadership is now female. That's a huge move over the past 10 years. But if you look at mining, it's about 5%. If you look at engineering, it's about 14%. And so there is a bit there that I think we could support. And even within certain cultures, there's still language that sort of prohibits women, sort of practices and behavior prohibits women from feeling included, appreciated, or supported. And I do think there is an opportunity within industry as well to really look at what does it mean to not just hire women, but to build plans within uh, their organization to support an inclusive environment for women to be successful. So if you do get pregnant and go on leave, you don't lose five years of potential promotion opportunities. And so those are some of the things um, that are still a challenge in the workplace. Within funding models, I think there's some really great grants out there that help advance initiatives, but a number of them do uh, require matching dollars or volunteer hours. I'm not sure when the last time a male would have put volunteer hours to advance their careers, but I think there is a big opportunity for us to not to demand more of women outside of all of that they do to put more hours into advancing their career, we need to come together on this. So in terms of proposal of what to do next, um, I'm sure my colleagues around the table would feel uh, similarly around this, but I think it's a mindset shift uh, to some extent where we have to say, how do we really change the conversation? How do we not do the same things again, but how do we do things differently? It's not just about women supporting women, it's about men supporting women. Uh, how do we think about changing rules and policies and bringing together industry, government, academia with a shared agenda, a vision and goals and objectives that we can advance. How do we make sure that someone is watching and learning how women are progressing in their careers and looking at ways to fast track uh, the promotions and their ability to not just get into STEM, but to get into leadership roles in STEM? How do we continue to promote and build and amplify uh, the role models and support them in being mentors for the next generation, but not having to, um, it being so cumbersome to the point um, that they can't uh, support more women at once. And I think uh, girls cannot be what they cannot see. So we need to get out there, we need to talk, 
we need to have roadshows and, and, and um, conferences and, and summits and opportunities of bringing women in different fields in the area, but also men in those fields as well. Because when men support women and men encourage other men to support women, I think we could uh, really advance this to the next level. I think that's all I really had. I'm happy to open it up for questions um, or wait until other presenters. Marianne, if you don't mind, we'll go through all of the presenters and we'll take questions sense. at the end. Thank Wonderful. you so much. Thank you. Awesome presentation. I'd like to next invite Nancy Diamante from the Association of Special Engineers, who's your scientist. Please go right ahead, Nancy, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, you know, as Chief Environmental Sustainability Officer at Apega, we're so proud to be the important initiative to support women in STEM. And uh, let me just get my video on here for you. <laughs> we see our role as sustainers of the profession and we, we sound and we kind of feel like superheroes because we see this as a real responsibility to support women in STEM. So I just want to share a few things of, of uh, what we're working on. So next slide, please. Uh, I'll run through uh, an action timeline that we have uh, for women in engineering geoscience of things that we're working on there. Uh, we have a member journey that we specifically focus on girls and women uh, and how we can support them throughout the entire member journey with APEGA. Uh, run you through a few of our outreach programs, uh, our 30 by 30 strategy, and our wage, our women and gender equality grant research. Next slide, please. So to give you a high level timeline, starting about 10 years ago, APEGA set a 30 by 30 goal. So this is 30% women in engineering and geoscience by 2030. And we're starting at about half of that. So we've got our work cut out for us. Um, 2011, our Engineers Canada, which is our national body, adopted the 30 by 30 goal and it gave it that national attention and profile. 2015, we created the Managing Transitions Guideline document and this is to increase retention after maternity or other kinds of planned leaves and it's now managed and shared nationally by Engineers Canada. In 2017, we had the Women in APEGA Advisory Group uh, established. In 2018, our 30 by 30 strategic plan was developed. 2019, we started a workplace culture and pay equity studies. And our 30 by 30 strategic plan was endorsed, endorsed by our APEGA Council. Uh, this year, we've developed the 30 by 30 tactical plan. We've created uh, the wage project pilot with permit holders. And we've completed a five-year salary survey data analysis. So I'll run through some of these things uh, in a bit more detail now. Next slide, please. So the women in APEG advisory groups comprised of representatives from across the province who work in both academia and in industry. And it's a group that meets regularly to assess diversity initiatives and discuss uh, other organizations successful strategies with the intention of increasing that representation of women in engineering and uh, geoscience professions specifically, but all STEM uh, subjects, both at the technical level and at the professional level. And the Women in a Pega Advisory, a Pega Advisory Group makes uh, then recommendations to our registrar and CEO and our executive leadership team about how to increase that representation, engagement, and retention of women in the professions to in ensure inclusivity and sustainability. Next slide, please. So to get the full picture of what APEGA is doing to encourage and support women in STEM, we start early and we stay with them throughout their journey with us. So let me tell you about Kelsey. Fact is, we met Kelsey a long time ago when Kelsey was in elementary school. So APEGA would have visited Kelsey's school to host a science night where Kelsey was inspired by the wonders of science and technology and engineering and math. And this spark was nurtured each time Kelsey attended an APEGA hosted event such as our Science Olympics or a rock and fossil clinic. When it was time to decide what to do after high school, Kelsey had long ago already decided to take engineering at school. 
So Kelsey was happy to see the familiar Pega logo at university events since she'd already had great experiences with us and became a regular volunteer on the Apega Student Liaison Committee, where she got to collaborate on lots of events with Apega and with the students and became an advocate for our 30 by 30 program. As Kelsey completed her engineering degree, she attended the ethics workshop to fully appreciate the regulatory and ethical obligations she was about to undertake. She then attended a PEGA's Emerging Professional Summit where she learned how to properly create a resume and how to interview and connected with a mentor to help further develop her skills and knowledge towards becoming a professional engineer. So Kelsey enjoyed a long and distinguished career as a professional engineer and appreciated the professional development programs she took through a PEG and became a lifelong learner, regularly volunteering and becoming a leader of women uh, in a PEGA. Uh, she even became a sought after speaker at various conferences and events and she advocated for equality, diversity and inclusion in the professions and across all industries. And she leveraged her Alberta grown experience to distinguish herself to receive global recognition of her contributions to the STEM professions. So the lifetime of connections with APEGA made us part of Kelsey's everyday life and her expertise is valued and we're considered a second family to her. So Kelsey even started an APEGA endowment fund so that she can continue to support and inspire future generations, especially girls and women, to pursue careers in STEM. Of course, Kelsey's a fictional character, but her experience is a real experience that we promote in all of our touch points across uh, all of our programs at APEGA. Next slide, please. So I touched on a few of the innovative programs and initiatives that APEG has developed to set that foundation of success for women in STEM when I talked about Kelsey. So I'll expand on that a bit because we've had both successes and challenges in attracting women into the STEM fields. We've developed an inventory of organizational practices and programs that are focused through the gender equality lens and our APEGA run K-12 outreach programs are developed by our outreach team who represent more than 40 years of experience in developing and teaching STEM subjects. So some of these programs are our APEGA Science Olympics. And it's an interactive inner school engineering and geoscience annual event that engages more than 1300 students in urban and rural locations across Alberta. So all science challenges are mapped to the Alberta programs of study and have been developed by work group, working groups comprised of professional engineers and geoscientists along with local teachers. Our STEMester program uh, offers grade 10 students an innovative, an innovative way to learn and earn credit for math and science 10 along with two career and technology courses. And this is through hands-on experiences. They tour job sites and university labs and manufacturing plants and oil sands camps uh, to learn firsthand from the professionals who use these STEM concepts in education in their everyday work. Uh, we have science nights and girl guide groups. Uh, we collaborate with schools and community groups to provide those meaningful learning experiences to students across the province. So two of our more popular events are our elementary science nights and our girl guide badge workshops. We offer teacher PD, um, we have numerous classroom ready activities and we teach how to design and tailor these activities for the needs of individual learners to ensure equality, diversity and inclusion practices are implemented. And our innovation and education awards. Uh, this helps schools and teachers that have exciting ideas that maybe fall outside their funding envelope. And so APEGA has set aside $50,000 each year to be awarded to 12 schools across Alberta to help implement these student-led and community-focused pro uh, projects. Next slide, please. So our 30 by 30 strategic objectives are, at the K to 12 level, we want girls to get excited about engineering and geoscience and not to feel intimidated by it. Uh, we want women as they move into uh, their career years to be passionate about contributing to society through engineering and geoscience and see that personal value in pursuing education in these fields, whether it's at the technical level or at the professional level. We want women to see that value in joining engineer and geoscience industries and that they're actively seeking employment in these fields and that they're fulfilled contributing to an industry culture of inclusion and making meaningful contributions through engineering and geoscience. And for women to have left, after they've left the professions, 
to maintain that sense of pride in their career and to inspire future generations of women that are interested in pursuing careers in STEM. Next slide, please. So how do we do that? Uh, it, in some ways, how we use the language in even how we market and promote. So how do we show engineering and STEM and how that work is tied to the community and the greater good and making a real difference in people's lives? And we got to start that really early. Um, because students, once they're in high school, they've already pretty much mostly picked a stream of courses that they're, they're going to be taking and they have some strong ideas about what careers that they want to improve. So we could, if we can start early in sharing some of the opportunities and getting them comfortable in these, in these fields, it makes a big difference in how they choose those career trajectories. How we use our multiple touch points early with these role models and to help girls imagine themselves and see themselves in these STEM careers and help the teachers that can sometimes be tentative about teaching STEM topics and incorporating STEM into the classroom. So we do teacher PD for this very reason so that we can support the STEM teaching in the classroom at all levels. Next slide please. So how do we support hiring, retention, and advancement within organizations? Through career level support, we've developed an inventory of practices in these areas through numerous initiatives at that career level, uh, such as our ethics workshop. So we waive the fee for first year students and registrants uh, that attend the ethics workshop, and that's available to all graduating engineering and geoscience students. We have a mentor program. Um, a study from 2008 showed that women who have a mentor can advance more quickly and to higher levels than those that are not supported. And our wage grant program. So a PEGA's three-year research program uh, sponsored by the wage department to investigate what are the barriers that women face in engineering and geoscience workplaces. Our retention and advancement best practices um, in our managing transitions document. It's that guide that uh, to increase retention after maternity leave and other planned leaves. Uh, and, and it's managed uh, jointly by Engineers Canada. And it's, it's really to, to help both the engineers and geoscientists that are considering these types of leaves, but it's also designed to help assist the employers so APEGA and the women in APEGA advisory group did that groundbreaking foundational work to create this national guide. And then of course, flexible work arrangements. This is one of the most important best practices to retain women in high potential talent um, and offering them that flexibility with work arrangements, whether it's from like start and end times, telecommuting, uh, virtual um, meetings, performance-based um, focus rather than hours in office. And I think we've all gotten a crash course in that recently with, with this COVID situation. But long before, um, you know, we were forced into these types of scenarios, it was something that we were uh, working on and promoting quite actively. So in 2018, APEGA was awarded $350,000 from a federal grant to investigate the barriers that women face in engineering and geoscience industries and to try and combat the problem of low numbers in women of women in these professions and find out why and what were the, their experiences. So we started meeting with partner organizations and consultations with members. Uh, research included literature reviews and pay equity surveys and analysis. We had select permit holders uh, that we partnered with to help us create a draft guidelines to test in a pilot program. And we're finalizing a second pay equity survey um, in the midst of COVID-19. But our work does continue. We've had a few delays uh, here and there, but for the most part, uh, this work is, is continuing throughout. Next slide, please. Our current state of uh, proportion of women in engineering and geoscience is 24.6 um, members in training uh, that are women. Um, professional engineers and professional geoscientists uh, are down at 13.7. So what happens in that interim time from between when they're members in training to the professional members and what accounts for this significant drop? Next slide, please. So some of the barriers that we've identified in our wage research, um, notions of traditional masculine work environment. 
um, lack of career development and advancement, certain biases and discriminations and workplace harassment, um, maternity and parental leave issues and concerns. Next uh, slide, please. As well as um, trying to balance work life, um, stereotypes or characteristics of women that, that we need to combat where there's a notion that this is not women's work, whatever women's work means, you know, that they're not welcome in certain industries or certain workplaces. What are some of the societal issues that, uh, whether consciously or unconsciously, promote those, those notions? And then some people don't even believe that there are barriers, that women don't have barriers. And so what do we do with those experiences and how do we support women so that they, they have tools to be able to combat these barriers? Next slide, please. So some of the internal labor market analysis findings uh, confirmed much of what we, we, we already know. So lower hiring rates for women at early career stages, lower promotion rates for women versus men, higher exit or turnover rates for women versus men, especially at, the, at that executive level. Next slide, please. And what are the historic pay equity analysis findings? So the promotion, proportion of females in engineering and geoscience hasn't really changed over the past five years. On, on the average, it's holding steady at about 20%. The promote, proportion of females in senior levels has not changed significantly in the past five years. Average pay has declined over the past four years for both men and women. The 2018 base salary is about 8% lower than the level of the 2014 base salary across the entire database. And entry level pay is not significantly differentiated by gender. Next slide, please. The pay gap between males and females at the qualified and senior level are statistically significant. In 2018, the average female base salary was 88.4% of the male base salary and statistically significant differences in pay for males and females are found across all industries, disciplines, and no matter what the organization size is. Next slide, please. So PEGA has created a pilot project and we partnered with five permanent holding companies for a one-year pilot project to assess their current state of equity, diversity, and inclusion initiatives. And we're working in partnership to shift that needle for women in their organizations. Now we've had to pause it due to COVID for the time being, but we're, we're gathering um, the guidelines and we're starting to meet virtually to, uh, to continue this work. Next slide, please. So the ultimate result of the WAGE project is to provide a research-backed policy guideline and recommendation changes that organizations can then make uh, to minimize the barriers that women face in engineering and geoscience professions. Next slide, please. So some of the actions, looking at workplace culture for behaviors that need addressing and implement these guidelines based on best practices from the WAGE research. So looking for those microaggressions, what are the systemic barriers, what are unconscious bias and, and have conscious inclusion training for all employees. Having policies and procedures already in place to ensure equitable hiring, retention and promotion, including women in profit and loss roles. Have succession planning and high potential promotion pools and training for staff that support this. For equity, diversity and inclusion to become part of workplace culture, we need champions at the top of organizations that that executive level uh, advocate and support and needs to be embedded in goals and performance reviews of employees so that EDI is prioritized in organizations. Next slide please. So PEGA's ultimate goal to elevate and support women in STEM is reflected in our diversity statement to encourage a business culture of belonging, inclusion and diversity for equity within the engineering and geoscience professions. And it sounds so simple and we're slowly making progress and we still have a lot of work in front of us, but we're so optimistic that this work is gonna continue and it will continue to improve the opportunities for girls and women in STEM. So thanks very much. It is such an honor and I'm really pleased to be here today to discuss this uh, uh, Women in STEM initiatives. Um, 
what I would like to do is just start with a little bit about myself. Um, my background uh, originally was in environmental sciences. I have a degree from the U of A uh, that I got right out of high school. I worked in environmental work for several years and then decided it was time for a career change. Uh, this was in the late 90s uh, where uh, there weren't a lot of environmental jobs at the time and so I thought maybe it was time to shift into something else where there was a little bit more um, opportunity. I still wanted to work in science and technology and so this led me to NATE. So I ended up taking a two-year diploma program uh, in engineering. It was called engineering design and drafting at the time. Now it's engineering design technology and uh, took that diploma and worked for several years uh, doing engineering design in uh, industrial projects, mainly oil and gas uh, related work. At that time, I also became an instructor at NATE in the program I graduated from. So I taught for several years part time while uh, working in uh, engineering technology. I eventually became a full time instructor, then I became the chair of the program. So I was the chair for about five years. After that, I moved into a department head role where I currently am, where I'm managing several engineering technologies at NATE. So um, I'm a huge advocate of uh, promoting women in STEM uh, programs, particularly because of my own experiences. And also, I would love to see more women in these areas of work. So today, I'll be discussing initiatives done at NATE uh, that we do to attract and retain female students in STEM programs. And I'm also going to discuss some of the opportunities to advance women in STEM, uh, in STEM here in Alberta. So next slide, please. So first, I would like to start just with some stats that I collected from Nate, uh, sort of discussing Nate and why the need to promote women uh, in STEM fields of work. Uh, Nate is a polytechnic institution uh, here in Edmonton, which means by being polytechnic, uh, we offer technical training, so science and engineering and IT technologies, as well as we also offer trades and apprenticeship training. So a lot of the work we do to attract women to STEM is also done to attract women to trades as well. So some of the information I'll be discussing will also include uh, trades education as well. So the data that I have on the screen here just gives, I uh, pulled a few uh, engineering technologies uh, as well as a science technology and an apprenticeship program. Just to give an idea of the snapshot, uh, just be a snapshot in time of just a little bit of the disparity and you can see why the importance to attract more women to STEM. So these are from 2018-19 uh, academic year. So this would just be students enrolled in these programs. So each bar is out of 100%. So if we look at engineering design technology, uh, my area uh, that I came from, it's about 30% female. The light blue at the top is the females, the darker blue is male. Next one is network engineering technology, which is under 10%, it's around the 5% mark. Construction engineering technology is about at the 10%. Chemical technology is actually more female than male. Uh, it's, uh, there are a few programs that actually uh, do have more females than males in them. This one's about 60% female and electrician is about 10% female. So it gives a little bit of a snapshot and idea of the disparities that we see at NATE and why we do uh, actively pursue trying to attract more women to these programs. Next slide, please. So initiatives that we do at NATE uh, currently can be broken down into three areas. The first is attracting new students who are currently uh, are currently pursuing or actively looking uh, to pursue, uh, continue or start their post-secondary education. The second is attracting young learners, and this um, was mentioned earlier uh, quite a bit with the Northwest and APEGA presentations, is that attracting young learners in elementary and uh, junior high as well, uh, where they still have a lot of time before they're actually choosing their careers and choosing their post-secondary institutions. And the last area we work on is retaining our current female students in STEM programs. Next slide, please. So starting uh, with attracting new learners. So NATE has several partnerships to attract more female adult learners to STEM and trade programs. Organizations that promote STEM and trade careers to women and young females often come to NATE uh, uh, to our campuses to experience the variety of shops, labs, field activities uh, that they would experience if they were a NATE student in these either uh, STEM or trades programs. As an example, uh, hands-on tours are held with Women Building Futures uh, to introduce and attract women to trades programs, uh, that's specifically the area they work with. Uh, similar tours are done with Careers the Next Generation for their young women in trades and technology camps. 
Uh, these are to introduce young women to trades and technology programs, again, providing hands-on tours so young women can experience the lab and shops uh, just as current NAIT students would. So they would get that experience if they were coming to NAIT. Uh, another group NAIT is involved with is Canada Learning Code. Uh, they're formerly known as Ladies Learning Code. Um, this is a national organization which offers uh, coding workshops uh, to adults uh, and uh, youth. NAIT sponsors the Edmonton chapter and, uh, of this initiative and several of our NAIT instructors in IT uh, volunteer with this initiative. Next slide, please. So the next is engaging youth. And so uh, NAIT offers many summer camps uh, that, uh, that are sports or activity based. Uh, but we don't only do that, we also um, offer career based camps as well to youth. So most of these are gender neutral, but we do have ones that are specifically to female youth as well. Uh, the ones that would be not gender specific would be engineering explorers and exploring skilled trade camps. But we also have one specific for females, uh, ones called journey girls. Uh, trade careers they explore in these camps include sheet metal working, CNC machinist and power line technicians. Uh, the engineering technologies that they also explore with these ones would be uh, areas such as nanotechnology and construction management. So a lot of areas that most uh, youth would not have an ex a chance to be exposed to. So it's really, really exciting. Uh, IT based camps uh, we run as well, uh, again, to expose youth to IT based careers. Uh, some of these camps include uh, computer game design, animation and web design. Uh, most of our recruitment has been face uh, has been uh, for these camps has been face to face camps, uh, but of course with uh, COVID, we are working more now looking at online opportunities uh, as well. Just because you don't want to lose some of the momentum, and you still want to get the students in, get them excited about these different programs, and you don't want to you don't want to hinder uh, moving forward in those ways. Uh, other thing that we do is Nate recruitment also encourages junior high students to come to Nate as well. Uh, even though they're not necessarily uh, looking for their post-secondary right away, but it's good to bring them in early and get them thinking uh, about the STEM or trades programs that they can take before they reach high school. So I know this was mentioned uh, in both of the presentations before, but and uh, sort of getting into why we do initiatives to try to attract a lot of the NAIT camps are for youth age 9 to 14. Uh, some of the ones that are the hands-on uh, engineering technologies and trades are more geared towards the junior high uh, level students. Uh, mainly as because, and this was touched on before, if you attracting a student, let's say we meet up with a female student uh, who's interested in an engineering technology and they're in grade 11. If they've now developed that they decided that they're interested in taking, uh, let's say, uh, civil engineering technology, fabulous, but if they've not taken physics, through high school, they now have a barrier to actually take this program. Uh, depending on the entrance requirements, if they haven't taken the sciences or maybe the level of math they need, they're in a situation that now either it can discourage them from wanting to apply, or they're going to have to look at either ways of upgrading, or perhaps um, it might even make them want to take a different program just based on the fact that the extra time that's going to be necessary for them to get into that program of choice. So instead of having them give up maybe on career choices like that because of these barriers, uh, if, we get, if we can get uh, two students in junior high before they start making these choices uh, for their high school sciences and maths and that, the courses that are required when you start to get into STEM careers, uh, it allows them to choose their courses accordingly and hopefully doesn't hold them back while making these choices. Next slide, please. So, uh, NAIT has several initiatives to help build community and provide role models for female students currently enrolled in STEM related programs. Uh, we have an annual networking event uh, to provide an opportunity for female science, technology and trade students to meet and talk to women who work in STEM related industries. We also host uh, lunch and learn events uh, as well for female STEM students. Uh, and trade students. These events again bring female, we try to bring leaders uh, in the variety of female industries uh, to, to talk to the, uh, to sit and have um, presentations or sit and have conversations with these students to talk about their work experiences uh, and what it's like working in STEM, STEM or trades fields of work. Next slide please. So 
Most of the initiative NAVE is currently pursuing focuses on partnerships with other organizations. Um, since COVID, pro, uh, program promotion, recruitment, networking opportunities have shifted to include online uh, initiatives, uh, which I'm sure is similar in lots of other organizations. Um, one area where well, we were actually already moving towards this, but uh, now, now pursuing it even greater, uh, youth recruitment is partnering with an organization called Actua, which is a national organization that develops STEM workshops for female youth. So we're partnering with them to be part of their national girls program. So just to keep the momentum and allow some other uh, options as well for uh, female youth interested in STEM programs. Our, as I mentioned before, our summer youth programming, like our camps, are shifting to include online options as well for this coming summer. Again, trying to make sure that we don't lose any of the interest and we're still attracting um, younger students uh, with the hope that, that they will continue and pursue STEM or trades programming. One thing that's really great though with the online offerings is that allows us to engage with students who normally can't come to the Edmonton area. So if there was a barrier uh, for them, either distance or they couldn't come to NAEP camps, these are now opportunities for these students uh, who are still interested in these areas to come and experience the camps uh, without having to be on site. So there's some really great opportunities that come with the shift to online, which is really exciting. Um, again, our open houses and recruitment activities are shifting to online formats this coming year. So again, there's a lot of worry about maintaining the same level of engagement, making sure that you're still able to showcase your shops, your labs without bringing people actually on face-to-face -face is a challenge. But again, hopefully it will engage people who maybe wouldn't have normally been able to come, uh, whether it's the travel or just even uh, get the time to come in. Hopefully the online offerings will help attract uh, or still continue the momentum and attract females to our technology and trades programs. So, next slide, please. So, uh, last thing I'd like to discuss is moving forward, uh, sort of uh, past COVID-19, but certainly COVID-19 has highlighted how women are the most precarious wage earners in society. Uh, due to COVID, uh, we, it certainly has highlighted how females are more likely to be in a position that has resulted in being laid off, uh, whether it be food services or retail. Women are more likely to be a frontline healthcare worker. Women with families are more likely than their partner to leave their job or to be a caregiver for their family or support their children learning at home. Um, if we think past COVID, at some point, many of these women who were stopped out of wage earning will need to return to work. So many of them will not be able to return to their previous areas of employment since positions have been reduced or eliminated. Um, so I've listed three initiatives that could help accelerate women in STEM programs. So the first is retraining for women uh, in higher demand areas that could support them returning to work. Um, I'm relating this to some of the government of Alberta's uh, programs. So the recent inf investment in infrastructure improvements such as roads and facilities promotes trades and construction jobs. IT is another area the government of Alberta has invested in to promote job creation. Both er of these areas could benefit from more women in the workforces. Promoting these areas as well as providing opportunities for these women who need to retrain to re-enter the workforce could help increase the number of women in these STEM and trades fields of work. The next edu uh, initiative is education for STEM career employers. Work needs to be done to educate employers of the importance of diversity in the workplace. Mm -hmm. Studies have shown that having greater diversity leads to more innovation. If everyone has the same background and experiences in a workplace, it is difficult to produce new ideas. Now more than ever, it is important for businesses to be innovating and forward thinking. Increasing the percentage of women in STEM related workplaces could help drive innovation. For the third item I've listed, an important point is that promoting women in STEM careers is not a female issue, it is a family issue. As a society, we need to support families. For women to return to work or retrain to develop new skills, families need to be supported. We need to educate society to reduce the stigma around male caregiving and better support men who choose to stay at home with their children. There needs to be more affordable childcare for families. There needs to be education grants and loans for women who want to train to work in these growth areas. These initiatives would help support the need to accelerate women in STEM careers. Next slide, please. So that takes me to the end of my presentation. Um, I would like to thank Minister here and the Ministry 
of culture and multiculturalism and status of women for this wonderful opportunity to present and participate in this discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carrie. Um, I think now that we've heard from everyone, we'd like to hear some questions from our virtual audience. So I would like to pass it over to my press secretary, Michael Forian. So Michael, if you don't mind taking it from here, thank you so much. And thank you, Minister, and uh, hello to our participants. And thank you to the presenters, of course. Uh, if, of course, you have any questions uh, for the Q&A portion of this event, uh, please feel free to uh, ask them in the Zoom group chat box. Um, we're going to try to get through as many as possible, um, and we already have a few queued up. So uh, this uh, question is from Deborah Harrop. Uh, how can we better support women that are in STEM careers to encourage them to provide those role models? Um, how can we help women who can be marginalized in their careers to move forward? And I open the floor to you. Yeah, for sure. Happy to. Thanks for the question. So I think it was two part one about role models and to what was the second part? So how can we help women who are more marginalized, marginalized. in their careers to move forward? You know, so that's true. Um, so I think uh, role models, what I found um, is awards tend to work really well, especially at the national level as well as at the regional level. And I think the opportunity to uh, give that third party validation that this is someone who's championed a lot of work within the STEM field or in the trades area is really critical. So I see, I see a huge opportunity there in um, rewarding and incentivizing women who have uh, sort of broken the barriers and got themselves to a place where it's really great. And I think women are so great at once they kind of make it, they bring the rest with them, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's like a, it's like an entourage. <laughs> so role modeling is great in that it starts to build a strategic narrative around what does it actually look like to belong in the space of STEM, and what does it look like to be successful in the space of STEM, and redefine the success through the role modeling. So I think there's lots of opportunity there. I would encourage us to not just role model women who have made it, but also women who are along the journey mm -hmm. and start to profile and build the storyline around that. Because mm -hmm. I think that's a much um, more uh, or easier way to kind of get girls and young women to think about uh, audacious goals, but also to see how they can get there. So this how part is, is part of the role modeling as well. In terms of marginalized women, I think the equity, diversity, and inclusion mandate that we're now sort of putting on the table with a stake in the sand by saying we really need to look at uh, intersectionality within diversity dimensions. Young ethnic females, if I told you the stories that I have gone through to get to where I am today, you would be shocked. Why is it so hard? <laughs> it shouldn't be this hard. And I think there's an opportunity for us to have an awareness and understanding what does it look like to be marginalized? What does it look like to be racialized and how that can pounce further as then you the, uh, have the other dimension of women beyond that or new immigrants. Like when I came here, I couldn't speak a word of English and it was so hard. And I have so many ideas in my head, I couldn't get them out. But I had sponsorship uh, throughout my career and that really helped me. So I think bringing visibility to those intersectionalities between uh, diversity dimensions and how that further compounds the issues. If you look at sort of participation in women in STEM and you see the percentage of that and then you look down and figure out what the next percentage is of diverse women, you're going to see it's a lot lower at half perhaps in some of the industries. So I could see he, tremendous opportunity just increasing the profile around that, really advancing the conversation around anti-racism in organizations, really understanding what racial equity looks like and what would be programs that would help support and amplify the voices of members within the BIPOC community who are traditionally marginalized and racialized. Thank you so much. And actually, maybe we'll jump to Nancy because Nancy brought up the whole idea of Kelsey, right, which was following a young person from the very beginning of their the culture of what they were interested in, how that transform. So Nancy, do you want to maybe take a, a, do you want to go up for this question as well too? Sure. That is so important, is developing those relationships early on so that they have clean role models in the industry and that they're not feeling into it or that they don't feel that, that even if the numbers are small, that they're not, um, 
they're not marginalized or they're not isolated because they'll have relationships already started or all, are already established. And I think um, the importance of having a mentor as well. So having a, a group of people that you can um, interact with and engage with is, is really important for that support level. But I think having an individual role model as a mentor is, is really key in being able to build that confidence, to be able to just ask the questions or to get that level of understanding of where, where an individual may be seeing themselves or specific instances that they're encountering that they need somebody to just talk to at, a, at an individual level and to be able to trust on that mentor level. I think that's, that's really, really important. I know a lot of work is done on one-on-one -on -one, uh, mentorship and with a lot of different uh, organizations and a lot of companies have mentoring programs as well. I think it's also important to look at group mentorship because depending where you are at certain times, you need a different type of mentor. If I was talking to a young woman in junior high, uh, partnering her with a senior executive may not be inappropriate. It might be inspiring, but it might not be the type of mentorship she needs. She may need a mentor who's in post-secondary, someone at that time and having perhaps access to someone who's inspiring as well as someone who's accessible and can more, you can more align your, your immediate needs or your immediate goals with is important too. So it's, it's nice to see uh, opportunities where you have uh, options to speak to or um, get inspiration and uh, advice from different levels of individuals at. And so it's not always uh, someone at the pinnacle of their career, but someone who's also moving along in their career as a, as a resource too. Yeah, very good advice. Thanks, Carrie. Let's move on to the next question, and then we'll go backwards next time. We'll start with Carrie and Nancy, and then we'll end up with Marianne. And so our next question is from Nazreen. Uh, Two-part question. What are some ways that we could encourage upskilling or reskilling of women and, and gender diverse people to take on roles in STEM? And the second question from Nazreen uh, was about technology access. You know, are there programs that offer low-cost access to internet and technology, so computers, uh, cell phones. Let's start with you then, Carrie. Oh, those are those are good questions. And actually, the second one I thought of when I was writing my presentation, I'm like, there's another barrier I didn't identify. Um, <laughs> I thought of late, but upskilling for sure. There needs to definitely. It's more than just putting a program in place. It, it's wonderful to put in either boot camps or workshops or opportunities where people can train and maybe work as well is great, but you have to, there's other barriers in place that make it difficult. So in addition to the program, there needs to be things that remove other barriers for someone to do education. If I'm doing schooling, it means I can't work. I either need a loan or I need some way to obviously continue to pay for my family if I'm choosing to do these things. And uh, certainly other barriers that might be childcare. There's a lot of things in place. It's not so much just choosing something, applying to it and starting the, the program, whatever that may be. But we need to a, make them see, and I think this was in the APEGA presentation, uh, you have to be able to see yourself. So again, providing the mentors and the sponsors so they can see people like themselves. It's hard to imagine becoming something if you've never seen someone like you doing it. Uh, it's a really, really big part, but you also have to create a pathway that is realistic for them. So whether it's the timing, whether they can only take evening courses, whether they can only do e uh, weekend courses, whether childcare is necessary at that time. So not only setting up the structure for the education itself, but also setting up the structure to remove barriers to allow uh, the women to take these courses. The low cost options is a more difficult one. I know depending on what uh, types of loans or grants that you have, there's sometimes some technology with that. But I think that's also another thing that has to be identified. Uh, we see this uh, at Nate really, really prevalent, even with staff or with students coming in. Uh, just because something is online and we think, great, it's accessible for someone, a lot of people do not have good internet. Um, a lot of people live off their, uh, live completely off of data. Uh, they use their phones as their only source and do not have Wi-Fi in their homes. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean you have a computer that if you were taking a, um, like the area I came from, engineering design and drafting, uh, the computer you require has to be a higher level computer to run the graphics programming. 
there are uh, other barriers, so you could just have um, a lower end laptop. So there are definitely some uh, uh, cost barriers as well to that that would have to be worked out as well. With I don't have an answer to that yet, but it's something that would have to be worked out. Thank you so much, uh, Nancy. Let's go to you. Sure. Um, just continuing on uh, some of Carrie's point. I mean. It's, it's just even knowing who to ask those questions to, I think, is really key. You know, you, you can have all the questions and looking for that information, but you don't know who to go to to even find those answers. And, you know, at Apega, it's not even like we have all the answers, but we have connections and we have resources that we can connect people with or that we can introduce them to and uh, to be able to you know, carry on with a, a relationship to be able to then support maybe a, a sharing or a loaning program. Um, I mean, there, there are numerous costs anytime somebody's trying to either upskill or reskill and uh, whether it's a situation um, that someone finds themselves uh, out of work or unemployed or they're just starting their career and they're trying to figure out, you know, if they're going in one direction, maybe, you know, d depending on the employment situation that, that uh, they're looking at, they might have to upskill or, or reskill in a, in a quick turnaround time. And so knowing even who to ask those questions to, I think that's really where if you have a group um, a group of people that you can just go to talk to about some of these situations or issues, chances are many people in that in your in your cohort are going to have those same issues and not know where to find those answers. And so being able to go to an organization that you trust and that you've got a relationship with, just to say where like how do I how do I maneuver this? And and they might not have all the answers, but they could certainly get you started and connect you with uh, with the information that you're going to need. Uh, NorQuest has developed uh, digital credentialing, which is alternative credentialing. And so what we offer right now are micro-credential programs and courses um, that are offered online or partially face-to-face, -face, and they're digitally badged to show the knowledge, skills, and competencies that people can build through short-term, bite-sized educational opportunities. And I think that's a really great way uh, to offer, um, to do sort of at your own pace at home whenever you need to. And we've worked heavily with industry to get buy-in for those micro-credentials to ensure that professionals, when they graduate for those, from those programs, that their employer are actually recognizing it. I think by digitally badging it and being very transparent around what the key learnings were and the outcomes and the skills that were developed, it's helping employers understand what those individuals are actually get in. So whether you want to go back and get your PM, uh, project management certificate or uh, upskill around uh, communication skills around inclusion, whatever that looks like, those micro-credentials are a really great way uh, to kind of stop the, um, the vicious cycle of, well, I need to put two years in in order to upskill or reskill. Now you can just put, you know, four to 14 weeks in and go at your own pace whenever you want to. Uh, the second thing around technology access, NorQuest ran a fundraising campaign I think back in May during COVID, we went to our uh, technology uh, and financial institutions that we had partnerships with and asked them if they had any um, uh, green opportunities around their technology assets and asked that they'd be willing to donate uh, some of those to our students so they could use them for those that didn't have access. And so what we've been able to do is actually get, and well, NorQuest contributed to that financially as well. I think we were able to hand out a little over 400 laptops uh, to our students to support them and we're not expecting them back so this was sort of a, a way to give for those who didn't have anything at home and for those who wanted access to uh, additional accessories and things like that we would work through a specific solution for them. The other piece as well I think as we offer more educational programs online we have to make them mobile friendly. We find that a lot of our Indigenous students don't have access to really good networks on communities and it, but they're always on their phone they have access on their phone so I think being able to make the programs mobile friendly is really critical and so that they can actually learn on their phone if they need to uh, on the go and in bite size. So those are some of the things that I think are easy and low hanging fruit that, that we can work through. Thank you so much, Maria. Do we have time for one more question, Michael? Uh, yeah. Uh, so this uh, question is uh, from uh, Jessica. 
Uh, and it's a question regarding uh, a peg up. So I'm going to read the, there's a few questions in there in total. So I'll read it in full and I'll perhaps let our presenters answer to the best of their ability the certain details uh, within each question uh, as they wish. So Jessica wants to know, how is a PEGA working with permit holders directly as the role of the regulator to ensure that EDI is part of quality management systems and PPMP requirements? And how is this being checked? She also wants to know how is EDI being incorporated into the APEGA regulator role? And lastly, um, is APEGA also collecting intersectional data such as accessibility, um, indigenous uh, uh, classification, sexual orientation, et cetera? And is this uh, publicly available? Why don't we start with Nancy on this since she's our APEGA superhero. You go first mm -hmm. and, then, and then we'll end up, uh, we'll end up with Carrie. Okay, so I, uh, I jotted down, I think I captured sort of the three parts. So the first part was around uh, how we're working with permit holders to, um, to promote uh, EDI within uh, their organizations. And we have the pilot pro uh, program that, uh, that we're working on. We've got five permit holders that, that have come forward to say that they want to work with us on our pilot program to test out uh, and work through some of the guidelines that, we've, that we're working to put together in order to address some of the barriers um, that are associated with the EDI uh, issues in the organizations. And so got paused a little bit due to COVID, but uh, we're starting to meet virtually with uh, the different permit holders to um, present our recommendations and guidelines based on our wage data and research and then uh, work together with them on the guidelines so that they become part of their policies and their procedures and, and work them into their uh, performance review um, for their staff. So it's built right into that work culture. Um, I think the other question was how we're incorporating as a regulator um, EDI practices um, now, as a regulator, I may need to clarify that question. Are you asking as part of APEGA as an organization internally how we're doing this or in our role as regulator? So I might need some clarification on that. Uh, while you get that, I think the third part was on the data um, on uh, EDI. and. The data we have gathered right now through our wage grant uh, research was specifically focused on uh, equality, diversity, and inclusion and, uh, and barriers for women in the workplace uh, in, in the industries of engineering and geoscience. So we still have one year uh, that we're working through that three-year research program. Once that concludes, then we'll be looking at what's that next level now that we want to uh, direct our research focus in. Uh, not internal to APEGA, but actually external to permit holders and professional networks, that's what she's seeking. Okay, so yes, yeah, so as, as that permit holder, we're in that, um, that guideline uh, recommendations phase still as part of that pilot project. And so it's still fairly early stages in that regard probably within, I would say in the next six months or so, depending on uh, how, how quickly we can continue to move forward uh, in, the, in this COVID world that we're in now. Um, we'll have a better sense of how we're landing on these guidelines and, uh, and how we will be then helping the five pilot um, program permit holders and how we can help them establish that within their own organizations. I think it would be hard for me to speak for the whole sector, but I know the organizations that the Coburn Institute for Inclusive Leadership works with um, have expressed a desire to understand how to uh, make a commitment on the leadership agenda for equity, diversity, and inclusion. What is the real business case around how do we actually implement this in a way that it's not just a 
tokenized approach and not just something to check the box in, but really to weave it into the fabric of the organization. I think looking at things where you bring in expats or individuals that were in the industry and sort of have left it now, but really have a great understanding of what works and what doesn't, uh, can come to the table and help advise around how do you actually advance this within the organization. There's some really simple things between looking at the daycare opportunities, I think, but flexible work style, maybe part-time opportunities, uh, in the field, I think those are things that have really worked well within the industry. And once you start to sort of pave a path forward, we find that the organizations we work with are more amenable to saying, okay, we could actually really commit fully to something like this now that we have insight into what it looks like um, and not just be paralyzed by the fact that there's so much that we could potentially do. I see there is a um, huge desire to look uh, at intersectionality sort of dimensions and to measure them. I don't think there's a lot of data in this space. Uh, I think that's something that's a gap and there is a big opportunity for us to start to really collectively uh, look at gathering this data and what it looks like. Uh, but uh, we don't have a specific way in which we gather right now, but the general sentiment from doing an assessment to each organization to see where BIPOC members are actually currently sitting, mostly in the front line. And so they don't have leadership roles and certainly uh, their participation up the corporate ladder decreases immensely. And so um, I think there is an opportunity there for us to figure out how to really have an assessment that doesn't uh, put anyone at a disadvantage by asking the question and then gather the appropriate uh, data through really good methodology and start to then make recommendations for action. But it's, it's, a let, it's an area that requires attention. Excellent. Actually, the last point you brought up was a really good one because often a lot of organizations don't have diversity issues. Mm -hmm. It's where the diversity is. Yes. It tends to be lower and then it trickles or diminishes as you, as you move up an organization. But uh, the collecting the data is a really interesting point because I think of just even when we collect data of staff or uh, students at NAIT uh, for our diversity and inclusion initiatives, um, collecting for intersectionality would be very, very challenging. I would think just in terms of how do you, how do you put that together and then work with it? Because it, there's so many things that are so subtle, and even just trying to ask the, asking the right questions, I think, would be very, very challenging. Yeah, people are always nervous about self-identifying as something. Yes, yes for sure. They worry. They worry about what happens to that. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Are you ladies up for one more? Sure. Yeah. All right. Uh, thanks, Minister. So uh, this question is from Suzanne. Nancy mentioned that there is a vision of having culture shifting to more inclusion and diversity. Just curious as to how they are hoping to measure success in this area. Nancy, do you want to start off since that one was directed at you? But I think uh, I think our lovely ladies here will all want to chime in on this discussion. So let me start with you. Measurement's always the hardest part of every vision, it seems. Um, and I think too, uh, being to the to the last point that we were making just around um, how we how we use and share data, having to be very sensitive and how that's collected so that people that are participating in these surveys and these um, interactions that we're having to gather this information, being uh, respectful and sensitive to to people's stories. They're they're very they are they're very sensitive. And so being able to then take that information, that data, create that vision, and then the success measures and the and the KPIs so that we we can track and measure the success of these programs. It all has to work hand in hand. And so um, as as we're as creating the vision for success is the exciting part and then how we're measuring that to be able to be successful um, i mean the the top top of mind ones are the continued conversations and the continued surveys and being able to continue to identify those those barriers that we're being challenged with that maybe we aren't moving the needle so quickly on and and how how is it that it isn't moving so sometimes it's almost more informative to identify what's not working and to be able to come up with new innovations or different ways of looking at it in order to address what's not working and then being able to measure 
what is working in continuing with that consistent, uh, whether it's surveys, uh, the combinations of face-to-face -face and, and more extensive conversations and building that level of trust so that people understand and trust what it is that you're doing with that data and why you need to be able to have that in order to measure the success going forward. So now do we go and collect data again? Uh, and whereas, of course, you're now creating fatigue with individuals who really don't want to be continually bombarded with that when they have other work or other schoolwork to do. So trying to um, and make sure you're engaging the right people at the beginning, I think, is important. And making sure that you have a lot of, um, a lot of people uh, providing input so that hopefully that uh, the biases you have will be uh, will be found and then you still have to be able to collect better information. Marianne? For sure. Uh, there's two tools I think that are really good uh, to shift cultures and organizations and measure them in an appropriate way. One, you have to do it at the personal agency level. So there is IDIs, which is Intercultural Development Inventory. And it's a good inventory that gets you to understand your uh, biases as an individual and bring attention to that and you can really debrief on it personally and start to build uh, your own uh, journey to learning and understanding um, and developing your competency in this space. So I think there is something there to look at the individual level. On an organizational level, there's a really cool tool called the Global Diversity Inclusion Benchmark. And uh, we're currently participating uh, with this group to develop what that looks like for organizations and uh, the tool looks at sort of assessing the organizational journey from sort of uh, the minimal things that you could do all the way to real parity and really inclusion and belonging. And, uh, and then what does it mean for you at each stage? What does it look like for you at each stage? What kind of programs that you have? How are you moving the engagement needle for your staff? What's your hiring practices like? What are your retention? rates like, uh, what are your development programs? And I think that global benchmarking gives us an opportunity to look at this holistically at the organizational level. And I think what it signals to a lot of organizations is that this is not just about initiatives and programs. This is a shift in mindset in the culture. And that, that requires quite a bit of heavy lifting and a tone at the top. That's why I think all of us have sort of reiterated this has to be weaved into your business goals. This has to be part of your leadership agenda of shifting the culture within organizations. And I think as then we do it collectively and we start to benchmark, uh, you could still see the needle and then collectively work on shared initiatives and opportunities and research and programs to see where else uh, shared opportunities could be addressed. Well, thank you so much to all of our participants for speaking today. Uh, Marianne, Nancy, Carrie, also thank you to the ministry staff and everybody who helped put this together. I just feel like I've just been absorbing so much information and your knowledge and experience is just so unbelievably valuable to us and um, you know just being able to have a path forward and to understand what that looks like. Um, before we conclude, I'd actually like to share some news with you. Um, I, I think it's a very exciting step forward um, the Alberta in the Alberta government support for uh, women especially in this field so we're announcing today that the Alberta government is creating a women in STEM award program and so this is a total of $125,000 that will be available to young women pursuing studies or careers in the STEM area so there will be 50 amazing women who will have access to this and I know it's going to make a big difference but it's actually it's a lot to what you've been saying this entire time about reaching their full potential having you know important partnerships that change the way that we look at the shift and shifting the way that we look at these things and creating spaces for these incredible young ladies and women just in general to be able to move forward so the program will be open later this year and i'm, I'm super excited to be able to share those details with you as they are confirmed um, but once again i um, just feel very humbled to have sat with it, with all of you in this space i hope that all of the people that joined us today got as much out of this as i did and i'm um, looking so forward to continuing this relationship and connecting in the future um, just to find out more steps and to get more information and to get the information out to you about the works program so thank you to everyone for joining us today very honored to be here thank you thank you